Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Sue Bryant. Um, I am an adjunct professor here at the Georgetown SAT program. I'm also an uh, undergrad here, uh, class of 1989, which is relevant insofar as um, one of my classmates, uh, Jeff Odlum, is also a co-author here. He was part of the undergrad class of 1989. His wife, Jen, was also one of our classmates. So there's a bit of a mini reunion going on here as well. So that's, that's awesome. So, so I know it's a Friday night. Um, and I just want to say thank you for being here. Um, I think it's the last night of classes. It's a beautiful day. The bridge is crowded. And so coming to attend a book talk on resourcing national security is probably a hard sell. Mm -hmm. So for those of you who are hardcore nerds, thank you so much for coming. <laughs> for our family, who may actually outnumber um, the other members of the audience, thank you also for coming. I really, really appreciate it. So I've got the honor of kicking this off briefly and then quickly shutting up so that we can let the subject matters uh, experts speak. So whenever you do this, the first thing you need to do is you need to begin with profound thanks and more than a slight degree of humility. So let me begin there. So in addition to thanking you all for being here, I need to thank each of the authors for their work and their patience with what has been an extraordinarily long process. Mark and I are truly humbled by the faith in us and the individual contributions that you all have made to the book which fundamentally exceeded all of our expectations. Thank you so much. So let me, um, let me throw out a truly scary statistic, um, which tells you how old we all are. So as I counted up the experience in the national security space our authors have, the conclusion that I came to is that we have a collective 315 years of experience <laughs> in national security and education. Um, so that actually gets us back to the Mayflower. Um, <laughs> we are not only old, um, we are also grizzled, um, and we are veterans of the bureaucracy of Washington, D.C. and how it operates. Um, six of us were supposed to be here tonight, seven of us actually are, which is awesome, so thank you, General Ferrari, for coming, um, and several are joining in via Zoom, so I need to give a shout out to those who are not here tonight. Um, first, we've got Jason Galui, who is a um, retired Army officer, and he is a professor at the uh, Cox School of Business at uh, SMU. Um, he also served on the um, National Security Council for both the Obama and the Trump administrations, served for three separate national security advisors, um, and was the deputy um, executive secretary for the National uh, Security Council. So. Um, please read his chapter because he talks a lot about how that space works. Um, also, we've got um, Lieutenant Colonel Heidi Demarest, who uh, frighteningly for me was one of my cadets when I taught at West Point, um, who is now the Deputy Department Chair at, or Department Head at the Social Sciences Department at West Point. Um, and then we've got um, Dr. Laura Juna Polzone. Um, who was the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Personnel and Readiness, and she wrote our readiness chapter. So you're not going to hear about this tonight, which is an encouraging way for me to say you should buy the book. Um, <laughs> so thanks for them as well. So several years ago, a friend floored me with the revelation that DC is nothing but Hollywood for ugly people. <laughs> um, that hit a bit too close to home, um, but I began the intro of this book with a lighter riff on that theme. People in the SSP program at Georgetown are a version of the talented and idealistic youth who wants to make their mark on the world, much like the aspiring actor looking to break into the movie business. And like that aspiring actor, the DC neophyte has absolutely no clue what they're actually getting into. So that was kind of the thought process in which we decided to make this book. This is a pracademic text. It's academically grounded, but it's intended to be practical. And it's a lot about process, and we hope it's not boring. Um, so this is about how the bureaucracy um, at works and how your awesome policy idea could actually get funded, because without funding, your perfect strategy will never be anything more than an interesting idea. So with that, I'm going to let the individuals and authors talk to you about their individual contributions. But when I reviewed the thing, there are a couple of cross-cutting themes that emerged, and I'll leave you with those before I get off the stage. One, hate it or not, the bureaucracy matters. Hate it, disparage it, rail against the absurdity of it but ignore it at your own peril. If you want to get things done in this town, study the rules of the game and learn to wield them like a ninja. That's how things actually get done. Second, which I think is a little more optimistic, individual people matter. Everyone at Georgetown SSP has studied Graham Allison's bureaucratic politics model. Um, you've, all, you've all eaten it. Um, but the heart of that treatment is that the reality is the individual competence is what carries the day when it comes to individual policy. 
It can be soul crushing, but you can in fact actually make a difference. Third, geopolitical frames matter. Whether it's bipolar Cold War or the engagement and enlargement of the 1990s or the global war on terror or the current great power competition. The frame matters, and if your strategy or program fits in that frame, you have a better sort, you have a better shot at selling it. Finally, we're all strategists. We love national strategic guidance. We love department level guidance. That only matters somewhat. Okay. As a national security professional, we follow the publication of guidance like some people follow movie openings. It's sad but true. But, and this is important, most of that guidance is neither funded nor prioritized. View all of these documents as statements of aspiration um, and, and, and treat them as such. And with that, as I promised, I will get off the stage and yield the floor to my co author, Dr. Mark Trout, who will introduce himself. Thanks. Thank you, Sue. And um, let me add my thanks to both uh, wonderful colleagues that have been privileged to work with over the, over the past two years, and, and many in the audience who uh, who helped us put together notes for uh, for this book. Um, both those who could be here and not here, and um, also to family. Uh, and I was um, doing a little bit of background research, and Sue, I think the gestation for an elephant is two years, um, and that uh, you know puts uh, puts this this book um, a bit into uh, into perspective. Um, I will uh, I'll just make some short remarks about two of the chapters in the in the book, um, chapter two, and uh, that has to do with um, resourcing national security in a democratic society, and then um, always a risk for an economist to write a <laughs> book, or a, rather a chapter, chapter 11, in uh, any book um, having to do with economics, but um, dealing with the United States government's newest executive department, and that is Department of Homeland Security, which as we did our research, um, we found more and more to be absolutely consequential in the, um, in the national security space. So, as we put together, uh, as we put together this uh, this book, it um, went from a central idea of the importance of um, the uh, national economy as an enormous resource generator that funds national security, but at the same time is in itself a strategic resource um, that is that is needful of, of cultivation. So. The intent of, of chapter two was to, to lay a foundation for that in, in ways that are uh, not always um, commonly known to, to national security professionals. And all of us know some of the inherent strengths of, of the United States economy, um, a large, very diversified economy, blessed with many natural resources and awesome uh, trans interior transportation network um, and um, really blessed to be in an area of the world that's relatively safe and secure and, and oceans um, uh, surrounding it that for years um, have been the foundation of, of the nation's security, but increasingly are, uh, are closed in. And then there were some attributes of, um, of uh, the national economy that uh, were maybe not so obvious. And um, those in, in no particular order um, that, that large integrated uh, market, but also a distinctive position that grew out of the, the post-World War II uh, um, security and economic order, uh, read that the Bretton Woods order that put the United States in the, in the absolute uh, center of the international position in a trade sense, but also in finance sense um, as well. And with that really gave um, uh, gives the United States um, a real ability to influence above its weight in some, in some really substantive ways. Trade, the centrality of the dollar in the international financial system, and more recently, developments in the energy space that have, uh, that have really left the nation um, in, in, a very, uh, in a very central position, but also in a highly influential um, position as well. And then going beyond that, a network of trade partners and financial partners that um, we have seen be uh, extraordinarily useful when they coordinate together um, in terms of the ability to marshal resources 
and um, and also act in a in a coordinated manner, and um, also to pool things like research and development and, and things of that nature and draw upon each other's um, uh, capabilities. And then there's the innovative capability of of the nation's economy that has consistently um, delivered uh, real growth at uh, at consistent rates that has both allowed the nation to double its living standard basically every generation and um, fueled really world-class capabilities and continue to be on the forefront of, of those capabilities. If you think about it in years past, many um, very um, useful capabilities in a national security sense, transportation, aircraft, um, uh, the, the internal combustion engine, and more recently, things like software, cryptography, those sorts of things have their foundations in an innovative national economy that then um, provides national security capabilities. So um, all of those things sum to a rather remarkable capability um, that has served the nation well, but requires cultivation. Uh, as a as a strategic resource, and as we wrote, a couple of things that um, that uh, that then um, really um, draw in on that and and place that in some ways at at, at risk. First, um, a sense of uh, broader industry being under attack, um, particularly in a digital sense. And just one figure that stood out both to Sue and I. Uh, by one estimate, now a couple of years old, the, um, the value of intellectual property theft being somewhere between 300 and 600 billion dollars per year. That's just slightly less than the, than the US defense budget. And of course, that's the theft that we know about, not um, that which, we, uh, that which uh, we don't know about. Um, and a, the, a fiscal path that is unsustainable over the medium to, to long term, um, that requires uh, that requires addressing before um, before those fiscal pressures uh, decrease the amount of investment in research and development uh, in um, uh, in in infrastructure and those sorts of things that have been very consequential in in consistently delivering growth and enlarging the, the nation's. Um, uh, possibilities. And of course, these are not positions that we made up ourselves. These are well-documented uh, trends. Um, the, you know, the, uh, the, the fiscal position of, of the country um, recently addressed by the Treasury Secretary, the Chair of the, Foreign, uh, of, of the Federal Reserve, and um, most recently, and, um, and uh, a paper by Rand, um, last summer that didn't make it out in time for us to include it in, in publication that, um, that uh, spoke to uh, the long-term um, pressures in the, in the federal budget that, um, that could be uh, national security threats uh, over, over a long time. So uh, we have this resource called the, the, the national economy and then that, uh, that transitions into um, one of the last chapters in the book, and that is um, the federal government's newest department, that is the Department of Homeland Security, which in a substantive sense safeguards the economic potential of the nation and also those governance, um, those governance functions of the nation that are so consequential in keeping this a free, open, and vibrant um, society. DHS is very unique. It's new. It's 22 here to four separate agencies in the federal government that have been uh, that have been consolidated into one, and it has got a, a breadth and a mandate of, of uh, national security coverage um, that is just vast. It's the entire country and um, and international connections as well. Um, DHS uh, has a couple of particular challenges. One is that a lot of the uh, assets that it is charged to safeguards are not under its direct control. And so it is left with is this very interesting uh, patchwork of direct capabilities that it, um, that it deploys um, much in a manner of, of uh, traditional national security capabilities 
against identified threats, things like the Border Patrol, uh, the Coast Guard, things like that. Um, then supplementing that with a, uh, a set of relationships, public-private partnerships, intergovernmental relationships. Um, a role as a lead federal authority where it has a very small capability and then receives augmentation from other portions of the federal government and, um, and other governmental uh, agencies. And then uh, a traditional role of providing direct resources in the form of grants um, and then seeking to uh, shape security choices by things like, uh, by things like regulation very, very difficult set of, um, set of uh, capabilities to corral together and, um, and see, to, uh, see to an aspect of the nation's security that is uh, itself increasingly under threat. I make reference to brazen warfare, which seeks to, uh, which seeks to address the uh, political systems and um, economic capabilities of a, of a nation as well. So where we were left as we did all of these, uh, all, of, all of the research and all of the writing associated uh, with putting these two chapters together is the centrality of, of the nation's economic base as, as a generator of, of national security capabilities to fund the nation's priorities and the centrality also of the Department of Homeland Security, its need for continued reform, unifying mission, streamlining its oversight in, in Congress and reducing the number of uh, committees that it, uh, that it reports to and raising both its profile and its mission to a level that is commensurate with the vast um, national security coverage that um, that uh, it is responsible for. So that's chapter two, that's chapter 11, that's kind of the bookends. And in between um, are the, the capabilities of the State Department and, uh, and the Department of Defense. So let me yield the floor to uh, Mr. Jeff Odom and uh, we'll talk to you about the State Department. Thank you very much. Very much. Um, it's great to be here. I'm going to take my mask off while I'm up here. Um, and thank you, Sue and Mark, for the what is really a privileged opportunity to join this very esteemed panel of, uh, of high-level thinkers uh, and scholars. Um, I am the, the clear non-scholar, uh, or at least non-faculty member um, on the panel. <laughs> my background, as Sue mentioned, Sue and I were undergraduate classmates uh, in Georgetown's School of Foreign Service back in 1989. I graduated, graduated about a month later, I joined the Foreign Service. I was lucky enough to join the Foreign Service um, that quickly. Uh, and I spent a very rewarding and happy 28 years um, in the Foreign Service. When I started, George Schultz was Secretary of State. And when I finished, Rex Tillerson was Secretary of State. So over the course of that span of time, I saw a lot of mutations and evolutions in how the State Department operates, some of which were for the good and some of which were not, as my book, uh, my chapter touches upon. Most of my career was spent as a political officer at the State Department, which meant that when I was based in Washington, I was doing a lot of policy formulation. And then overseas, the second, the other half of my career, I was doing a lot of policy implementation or, or diplomacy um, as we know it. And not, not surprisingly, as a result of that personal experience, I do consider um, diplomacy, and I mentioned this in my chapter, to be the most important, in my opinion, the most important and most cost effective of the tools in the toolbox of national security. Uh, I mean, all the tools have their own important roles, but diplomacy is kind of the coordinating instrument through which all of the other tools can operate effectively. And without diplomacy to support those other outcomes, they probably won't be as successful. So, uh, and I felt like the State Department has always done diplomacy pretty well. Now, interestingly, it wasn't until about the 20 year mark in my career when I had the opportunity to go to the National War College uh, to get a master's degree in national security studies. That's the first time that I really became aware of the idea that crafting an effective strategy requires um, the coherent and constant uh, balancing, understanding and then balancing of ends, ways, and means, that phrase ends, ways, and means. And I know that every graduate course in IR and probably all the military officers uh, in the room uh, have heard a lot about ends, ways, and means. But I need to point out that 
at the State Department, this concept of balancing ends, ways, and means is not, not an integral part of State Department organization or culture or training. Most of what we do and what I did was frankly on the job training without a lot of understanding of, uh, of the craft behind what we were doing. Um, and it wasn't in fact until after my war college experience when I returned to the State Department and I got had the chance to be an office director and an acting deputy assistant secretary of state that I was directly involved in the budget process and, and trying at that point to understand how to make sure the budget process was at least somewhat synced uh, with the policy process. And that's the first time I had authority to actually impact both the budget and the policy process. So it's been 20 years kind of blindly ignorant of how important it is to make sure the two were aligned. And that experience very much informed the, the chapter that I wrote. Now, when I think about diplomacy, Henry Kissinger, I think, once said that diplomacy is the patient accumulation of very small victories, uh, which, which makes sense. There is a lot of incrementalism to how the State Department operates. A lot of that in incrementalism is the result, frankly, of what I would call muddling through. Um, is trying to push for policies uh, uh, that don't necessarily, aren't necessarily lined up properly, that are misaligned with, with ends, with ways and means. When, when the, the ends and the ways and the means are misaligned, you tend to get muddling through. Um, and thankfully, the State Department is very full of bright, hardworking foreign policy experts. So even when we muddle through, usually it was more or less um, successful. Every now and then, though, we are confronted by a foreign policy failure, a significant foreign policy failure, where clearly the ends and the ways and the means were misaligned, where we had a policy goal and we didn't think through the ways and the means to do it. And I think recently at Afghanistan, for example, we can debate whether that counts as an example. Um, so a, 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 another related point, and then I'll talk about the highlights of my chapter, is that uh, we all did our writing in the final year of the Trump administration. Uh, I just want to clarify, although it's, it's my personal opinion that that administration's general disregard for coherent strategy making and general disregard, disregard for a functioning interagency process did contribute to some foreign policy dysfunction. But I do want to clarify that what I'm writing about in my chapter, the problems that I identify in the chapter have been systemic uh, and long term and, and not, not a symptom of any specific administration. Um, so the main thesis of my chapter is that the State Department and USAID's approach to developing high-level diplomatic and development strategies is largely disconnected from the budget planning process, and that unless state and USAID take uh, pretty dramatic steps to better integrate policy planning with effective resourcing, American diplomacy and American foreign assistance run the risk of becoming ends unto themselves, uh, and run the risk of potentially leading to diverting scarce resources for uh, ineffective, uh, ineffective programs and, and achieving ineffective goals. Um, and that really, at some point when carried through long enough, that could really lead to an undermining of US interests and US values uh, overseas. Um, so my chapter describes the separate and distinct processes at the State Department for developing strategy on the one hand and uh, developing resources or proposing resources on the other hand. Both processes are slow and bureaucratic. They have that in common. Uh, both take at least a year or sometimes 18 months to go from start to finish. And both largely involve different uh, uh, sets of decision makers and different legal authorities, which can complicate the problem. And we'll, we could talk about that more during the Q&A. The policy process in a nutshell is, is usually driven top down uh, usually begins with the White House publishing their national security strategy. Uh, and it's unfortunate Jason, uh, Jason Lilly's not here because he could talk a lot about the importance of the national security strategy. Normally that comes within the first six months of a new administration. And normally that prompts then, or at least informs the, the, the issuance of the joint, the combined state and USAID JSP, Joint Strategic Plan, which is a four-year plan. Uh, the recent one just came out, as a matter of fact. That JSP going downwards then informs within the State Department every bureau, every regional and functional bureau, and every embassy overseas then do their own bureau strategy or integrated country strategy, uh, an ICS. And that integrated country strategy at that bottom level for every country, that's actually the most operational of all these documents. And that's the main point at the ground level where finally, finally, you have the policy and the budget uh, where they come together and they hopefully match up more often than not, they don't. Uh, and by the way, Congress plays very little role um, in this strategy making. 
uh, by, by the State Department. Now, by contrast, the State Department's budget and resourcing process is much more bottom up. Uh, every year, a budget resource request comes out from undersecretaries of policy and management who are at fairly high level, and it goes out throughout the building to every bureau, requesting of every bureau and every US mission or embassy that they have to then craft their budget. So that's what they do. Each of those units, and there's probably 200 of them, each of those units then goes about crafting their own, their own proposed budget based on their own assessment of priorities on the ground. They almost always use the previous year's budget as a baseline, and they almost always try to add more money to it because that's a bureaucratic imperative. Now, in an ideal world, those bureau and embassy level budgets would be guided directly by the most recent national security strategy uh, and by the most recent JSP, but there's no requirement uh, to do that, and there's no guarantee that that happens. And these proposed budgets then move their way up the bureaucratic ladder. They get vetted by each bureau's policy and budget office. The State Department Office of Foreign Assistance Resources looks at them. The State Department Bureau of Budget and Planning looks at them. They finally go to the OMB, Office of Management and Budget, out of the White House, which pulls them all together. That becomes the state's uh, State Department's Congressional Budget Justification, you've heard CBJ, which goes off to Congress. It also helps inform the, the president's um, budget to Congress. So there is some alignment at that level. And from there, it's up to Congress to produce and debate and approve and eventually enact the State Department Foreign Operations and Related Programs, SFOPS, uh, Appropriations Legislation, which is its own uh, bizarre and unwieldy process. Um, but I will, I will spare you the sausage making description of how the SFOPS works, because that was actually a little bit beyond the State Department part. Um, but suffice it to say that this process is often complicated um, once it gets to the Hill by partisan political considerations in Congress, which can result in legislative force trading as, a, as having more impact over, over budget outcomes rather than core strategic interests. So the legislative force trading really becomes a driving factor in determining budgets for important strategic programs uh, at state. Now, there are also many within the State Department, there are many cultural and organizational obstacles that also contribute to the scope piping between the policy and the budget process. For example, most State Department employees, especially FSOs, do not receive training on how to do strategic resourcing. And they normally don't look for uh, promotion, they don't look for assignments that help them develop budget or resourcing expertise because it is not career, generally not career enhancing to do so. And that's unfortunate. And that does contribute to, to a stove piping uh, within, the, within the building. Luckily, all is not lost. Um, most of the challenges that my chapter identifies can be overcome. Um, my chapter makes several recommendations, including that number one, in an ideal world, Congress should consider adopting an annual comprehensive uh, national security authorization legislation that integrates the military and the non-military national security accounts in the same process into one account. Now, that's, uh, it, it's a bit of a pipe dream. I mean, a lot of people have called for that, but the way Congress works, that's very unlikely to happen. So barring that, I am strongly of the view that Congress should commit to adopting an annual State Department Foreign Assistance Authorization Legislation, which has not happened since the mid-1980s. And this would provide strategic direction to the Foreign Affairs Appropriations Process, which is a subordinate process, which at the moment is the only process for, uh, for legislating funding for state. A third idea is that the Secretary of State would easily simplify the competing patchwork of authorities that control the policy and the budget processes. He or she, the Secretary of State, could integ better integrate the policy and resource processes by putting them on the same timeline and by establishing a policy and resource integration unit that reports directly to these undersecretaries that I talked about before with the authority to recommend real-time policy and resource rebalancing to senior leadership. A fourth recommendation I made was that the State Department could, should create incentives within the Foreign Service assignments, training, and promotion systems to encourage or even require, mandate FSOs to develop this expertise to pursue diplomatic assignments that work on national security resourcing. It could even be made a requirement of elevation promotion to the Senior Foreign Service. I think it should be. Uh, and fifth, the State Department should leverage cutting edge, cutting edge data analytic capability tools to analyze the impact of the policies and the programs and to feed those analytical insights into the integrated policy and resource planning process. 
Now, the good news is that the Biden administration uh, and the Blinken State Department are indeed right now exploring some of these recommendations. I don't think they got them for me, but they are looking at some of these recommendations as part of Blinken's modernization initiative. Among the things they're looking at are um, making it more career enhancing for an FSO to take an assignment outside of his, his or her cone. So for example, to do, a, to do an assignment that learns how to, how to resource budgets properly. Um, and the department is also starting to finally apply advanced data analytic tools to all the data that the state department is sitting on and to tie those to outcomes, which is very promising. Um, it needs to be better funded, but it's very promising. So I do have some hope for some progress, um, uh, some change by this administration that potentially could lead to greater policy and budget uh, integration and coherence. And in the meantime, uh, I'm just grateful to Sue and Mark and to Cambria Press for allowing us to uh, to write these chapters and to try to get these ideas out there and to make the book a reality. I do hope it plays some small part in better educating the, the graduate students that you all have who are the future leaders, future national security leaders um, of our country and helping them understand the critical importance of more properly coordinating uh, diplomatic and foreign assistance ends, ways, and means. So thank you. And Hoya Saxa. <laughs> You know, oh, so much. So I have the unenviable task of being sort of between what was DHS with Mark and Department of State, um, and all that standing between you and DOD is me. <laughs> um, and we know SSP loves some some hard power, so I'm going to try to be really quick. Um, and I also want to. First, really thank Sue. Um, it's really rare, uh, for those of you who are doing any sort of writing right now or who've done it in the past, I think having the idea of what you want to write is often the most difficult part of the endeavor. Um, and so when Sue was pr first proposing this book about resourcing national security, I mean, I thought about many of the courses I had taken um, and, and the kinds of books that were really essential to that education. And of course, DOD is sort of central to those conversations. I'm looking at, at General Meese in front of me as my former, my former boss as an, an econ P. And of course, the DOD is the like 10,000 pound gorilla in the room. Um, and so the fact that she humored me um, and let me write a chapter about the UN, um, I don't know if it's just the kindness or that that you, that you work for SSP, but thank you. Um, so I am a boss. Well, I was, that's, that's, that's a, loose, a loose, I would not, I would not say that. Um, so I, um, a, a little backstory to the chapter itself. So I was in the army for 22 years and my last three years in the army were spent at the state department. So um, very much appreciate um, Jeff's contribution as well, since much of the state department is a mystery to those of us who were or are in uniform. Um, and when I got to the State Department in the Office of International or the International Organizations Bureau in the Office of Peacekeeping Sanctions and Counterterrorism, I didn't know a single thing about the UN. Um, and so this chapter is really the things that I wish I would have known um, as a person trying to do this work. And afterwards, as a professor who had created a syllabus called the US, the UN, and Peacekeeping, in which there was no chapter that sort of explained the practicalities of how the UN budget system actually works. So I know that we're all nerds in this room, admittedly, but the number of UN nerds is even smaller than just the security <laughs> studies nerds. So thank you for humoring me at all. But I want to also recognize two people in this room. So Dan Henderson and Helena Stein, who were both um, students and um, research assistants of mine and who took the course. Um, and were really instrumental in helping me behind the scenes get the chapter together. So not only was writing the chapter easy and that it was a topic that I loved and was really passionate about and saw the usefulness of having such a chapter, but then to have support from amazing students like the two of them and so many others at SSP, I feel like it's such a privilege to really be a part of this community that um, is just amazing in really every way. Um, so to start off, to, to tell you the, the level of US involvement in UN peacekeeping when it comes to the financial side of the equation, um, I'm gonna quote Sue's favorite quote, which is the US spends more on Halloween candy in a year than it does on UN peacekeeping. Hmm. So let that sink in for a second. Um, there's a lot of conversations about the useful or uselessness of the United Nations and the peacekeeping enterprise in general. Um, and I would say, first of all, you know, it's not as expensive as candy at a minimum. Um, and at best, there have been 71 peacekeeping, 
peacekeeping operations in the UN's history since 1948. And there are only 12 of them that remain in operation today. So by my count, that means there have been far more successes than failures. So without going into the, the nitty gritty details of the chapter, which most of you probably aren't too interested in, um, but the whole tenor of the, of the chapter really tries to explain the inner workings of the UN, how their budget is made, and then how they decide um, if the funding has to come from the entire world, how is that pie divided between the 193 members of the world, of the UN? Um, the US has been the biggest contributor to the peacekeeping budget since forever. Um, and in large part because the equation for those skills of assessment or how the pie is divided is really based on um, an equation, GDP, GDP per capita, debt burden, and then um, a premium for those who serve on the Security Council. So the U.S. has and will continue most likely, hopefully, um, to have the largest share because that means that the U.S. still has the largest share of the world economy. Although I think an interesting trend has been the increasing share that China has had, um, in part because of their own economic trajectory. So um, they have supplanted Japan in the number two spot as the largest financial, the second largest financial contributor. And of all the permanent five members, um, the US, U, um, UK, France, Russia, and China, China is the only one of those um, five P5 five members that has is in the top 10 in terms of troop contributors as well. So typically the, the funders of the peacekeeping missions themselves are typically the developed world, those who have a really um, strong and robust economy, and those who are contributing troops and police to, to peacekeeping missions are largely those from the developing world. So the, the other nine in that bucket of top 10 actual contributors, keep, you know, countries who send troops, uniformed uh, military or police, are Bangladesh, Nepal, Ethiopia, Egypt, Indonesia, Ghana. Um, those, those are some of the countries. And, and why and how does that actually work as well? Um, another thing you may or may not care about, but um, countries pay their own troops and send them to these peacekeeping missions, and then they're reimbursed at a rate of $14.50 per month per soldier. Um, the rates of reimbursement for soldiers and for equipment that's deployed is renegotiated every three years at the UN, as is the scales of assessment that percentage that every country pays. And so part of the chapter discusses when those moments occur and when they do, how much effort is required to actually make change um, that's advantageous to the US in terms of either how much or how little change is going to be with the troop contributing um, salaries, the equipment, or um, obviously when it comes to the whole pie, if the US is going to pay less, um, someone's going to have to pay more. There's no, there, it is a zero sum game. And so thinking about that effort, there's only been one time where we were very successful at doing that. And it was Ambassador Holbrook for an entire year. And there's a lot of frustrating um, that happened. So um, it both tries to highlight the, the things that are unchangeable, which I think is important to know as, as a bureaucrat and someone who appreciates process. And then when there is a change possible, the kind of effort that's required to actually make that happen. Um, so that's sort of the overview of the, the chapter, um, and I will stop there, but if anyone has questions on anything you and you don't want to ask in front of all of your hard power <laughs> friends, I'm happy to stay after and talk all things you and afterwards. Nor, I'm now retired. I think I was already old when Brian graduated from Georgetown. <laughs> and I probably a disproportionate share of that number, 315. <laughs> I also spent <clears throat> almost 15 years at the Brookings Institution watching fellows finish a singly authored volume and then say, I think I'll do an edited volume. It, it's quicker and easier. <laughs> There's a reason I've only produced single authors. <laughs> Two years is not a long time. <laughs> and, and actually, this this was so much more congenial than I mean, it, it could be pretty pretty good. tough to an edited book. My my chapter is on the budget process in the in the broadest broadest sense. So in a, in a way, it's not just about the defense budget, but since the defense department is roughly half of the discretionary budget accounts, 
you know, there's a lot to be said about the defense budget. I ground the chapter in a, in a very fundamental observation. The, the founding fathers separated the legislature from the executive branch. Now that sounds, you know, we're, we're just used to that. We take it for granted, but Senator Moynihan years ago noted that America is the only democracy that actually has a separate legislative branch uh, which competes with the executive branch. Most, most democracies are parliamentary. As long as there's a stable coalition, you have a consolidation of executive and legislative powers. And if, if the coalition that supports that is unpopular, then you vote them out and you put another coalition in. But as long as the coalition is stable, then the executive and legislative functions you know, operate you know, with unity with the command. In, in our system, the people who do things in the executive branch are totally separate and often uh, at loggerheads with the people who pay for it. And as, as we said at the outset, if, if you don't pay for something, you know, not, not much happens, it depends, mm -hmm. if you don't pay for it, right? So this, this sets up a, a very strange budget process with, with uh, uh, several repercussions. I'll just uh, uh, dwell on a few of them. Uh, the first is E.D. Rhodes hierarchy. If you're the Secretary of Defense and you look down, you're looking down at a, a pyramid under secretaries, assistant secretaries, you know, thousands of people, but it's a pyramid and you're at the top. If you don't realize that there's this huge dotted line that goes across the Potomac to the hill, you're not going to be a very effective secretary, which is one of the reasons why this old adage, which is as, almost as American as, as apple pie, we just need to get a good businessman or woman in there to run this like a business. That's not what the founding fathers set out to, to have this, this government do. Okay, so you've got to recognize that uh, you've got to work the hill uh, or you're not going to be able to protect your, your programs. Sometimes they'll tell you, John McCain was famous about saying, hey, I'm over here and I don't like what you're doing. Senator Reid, who's uh, uh, now the chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, operates much more quietly, but still, you're going to be reminded of that uh, over and over. But it's not just the secretary, all through the department, you know, there's constant interchange across the Potomac. Sure, right. So you're a program manager, uh, and you go over to testify in your program, and you find that you're asked some specific, hugely critical, very knowledgeable questions. Where did those questions come from? Somebody working for you, right? So if you thought you were in control of this, you're not. Now I have a, just one case study, and I don't really want to inter, uh, uh, identify the person. I, I invited a guest speaker over from I think it was the SACD or the HACD, the Appropriations Committee, Defense Subcommittee, uh, who had been on the subcommittee staff for over ten years, handling among other programs Air Force Tactical Air which meant that this individual knew more about Air Force tactical air than any uniform general in the Pentagon who had just rotated out of the tactical wing command or whatever. You know, in fact, I, I think I think uh, Heidi uh, Demarest has a, a point in her chapter where somebody goes over to, to, to sort of coordinate before the boss comes over to testify on the Hill and came back and said, that staffer has all 10 years of this program on her shelf. I don't even know where those are. Those three people are. <laughs> okay, so this this individual knew Air Force TAC air programs, and their budget came over, and proposal came over in 2017, 2018. Looked at it, found that it not only had some really incongruities in it, but it contradicted where the program had been heading several years before that. Right. So he calls over the Air Force programming staff, and they renegotiate the Air Force Tactical Air budget program. Okay. So the programmer in the Pentagon in the Air Force thought he was in control of this, or she. Uh, no, sharing control. Okay. So that's you know, there's no unity of command here. And if you've been a division commander or a, an air wing commander, or the, God knows the captain of a ship, boy, the power that accrues to that individual, and then you step into the Pentagon, this could get you like a cruise missile beforehand. <laughs> right? Okay. The second, the second. Uh, implication is there's an enormous incentive to create a consensus, right? Because if you piss somebody off in the Pentagon, you're going to hear about it, you know, unless they're deaf, dumb, and mute and don't have a telephone to call somebody on the hill, right? So you, you want to include everybody, including key hill staffers. This is a way you get camels, right? 
forces designed by committees. And you know, when I say that, you say, well, well, wait a minute, we have the best weapons in the world. We do, we do. And I often wonder, how does that happen? <laughs> and and, I, and I, one, one metaphor, which I will not press too far, you know, a thoroughbred racehorse does one thing exceptionally well, very brittle outside that mission scenario, right? Camel's a little bit less fast, but probably a little more flexible. Plus, don't forget the power of product modification over time. You know, you get something out there. This is, this is why I think that the notion that uh, R&D stops when we go into production is just a, a fantasy. I mean, we're, you know, somebody once told me, a friend of mine at Northrop Grumman, there's a billion dollars of R&D that goes into the B-2 every year. A billion dollars. You know? and, and it's a much better airplane than it was when they produced it. Development continues. And, you know, within the confines of that system, you start to make it better. I often think, you know, you're a pilot, you're at 35,000 feet, Mach 1.2, and you're thinking, I'm flying a political outcome. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a pretty good airplane. Anyway, um, everybody knows this in the building, right? I mean, well, not everybody. Uh, but, but you know, most people know it uh, in the building. And, and so uh, you, can, you can get, uh, I'm trying to say to you, you know, you, you can get interesting strategies which are based on predicting what the hill might do. Let me, let me just give you an example of this. Uh, and, and it's old enough so that nobody will remember it, but I wrote about it 40 years ago. The, you know, you all know the Apache helicopter. Uh, it has a Hellfire missile that has this massive, highly sophisticated chin toward it. It didn't start that way. It was going to be a tow firing, fairly simple gunship to replace the, the Cobra. Uh, at the, the end of the demonstration and validation phase, and I don't even think they call it that anymore. That's how dated I am. <laughs> the Army noticed it had the Hellfire missile in development, but it, it wasn't designated to be hooked at anything. And, and they said, if we don't hook it to something, we're going to lose it. Congress will cancel the Hellfire. So they hooked it to the ongoing, what was then called the Advanced Attack Helicopter in, in about 19. The, 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 product, uh, the contract was signed in early 73. In 72. The program manager up to then was on. He was furious because he wanted to put out a tow firing A model, save the Hellfire for later. It, 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 you know, it's not to say that the Apache isn't a terrific helicopter gunship. But at the time, the addition of risk and cost and time to that program brought it into to some trouble with Harold Brown, who was Secretary of Defense from 77 to 81, and who, who didn't necessarily not like the, the program, just thought it was becoming more expensive. It took a lot longer to produce, to, to develop than the Army thought. Again, you know, just a decision that, that had technical merit in some sense. But was grounded also in a political observation of what would float, uh, float on the hill. Now, what I've said so far suggests, oh, this is terrible. You know, it, it, actually, this is a system that can protect innovators. Okay, you know, in, in my favorite program, again, so old nobody will remember it, is the lightweight fighter program, which started in 1972, right? Uh, and it was started by a, a small group of Air Force fighter pilots, the Fighter Mafia, it was called at the time. Who didn't like the way the Air Force was going with very fast straight line fighters that fired beyond visual range, range missiles. They really believed that dogfighting was the essence of air to air combat. They had friends in OSD, they had friends on the Hill. You know, this was this was still very close to the McNamara years. People were so upset with McNamara's total package procurement. They were looking for prototypes, they were looking for alternative ways to do business. So they had a a coalition that stretched over to the hill. The one person who didn't want this was the chief of staff of the Air Force. He had the F-15 just going into production. The last thing you want when you've got a new system going into production is a competitor, especially a cheaper competitor. No matter how good it is, if it's cheaper, it's going to get some attention on Capitol Hill, right? So the Air Force hierarchy really didn't want this. Now, in the end, Mel Laird, again, not a businessman at all, chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, a shrewd politician, approached the Air Force in 73 or four, just before he stepped down, I think it was in 73, and said, look, if we, if we buy the, what became the F-16, you can buy more wings. I'll let you buy the F-15, but if you want more wings, you're gonna to have to embrace the F-16. And they did. Now they redesigned the aircraft, they added air to ground, it doesn't kill its pilot anymore by turning too fast. You know, it's, it's a, a little stodgy rear airplane, but it's a great airplane. Right? And there's so many of them out there. 
Okay, uh, I could go on, but I, I, I will stop there. That, you know, everybody wants to reform. I, they're not going to reform the Constitution. And the logic I'm talking about is really rooted in, in the Constitution. And I, I know it's 230 years ago, but it still shapes the way we, we do business. I, I, I don't think you should go in to fundamentally reform the process. Just recognize that it's highly political. And if you know how to play the game, you can get two or three outcomes that you want. And that's, that's all anybody in the Pentagon ever gets. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, so, uh, my name is Mike Lennox. I had the privilege to spend 30 years in the forum and uh, I keep it on. Okay, well, sure. yeah. I can. Um, and then uh, the last eight that ran, um, I had the unfortunate experience uh, in some people's minds of spending 13 of those 30 years in the Pentagon and two mm -hmm. more at three or four star level headquarters doing strategy kind of stuff. And so Sue and Mark asked me to write a chapter that came out of some work that we did for OSC policy uh, back before Secretary Mattis wrote the 2018 uh, National Defense Strategy. And OSC policy came to, to us at RAND and said, um, we want a sandbox inside of which we can test candidate national strategies. Uh, we want to be able to test the strategy in four hours. Uh, we want it to be a worldwide strategy with thinking, living, experts representing potential adversaries. Um, and we want to run it many, many times because we want to we know the world's uncertain and we want to be able to test these strategies uh, against many different kinds of world environments. Well, if you're going to test the strategy in four years, um, you have to think about it at a relatively abstract level. You can't get into 9,000 different line items that might compose that DOD strategy. And so my colleagues and I sat down and we really thought about, well, when it comes down to it, if you're the Secretary of Defense, if you're OSD, what are the really big questions that you're answering? And of course, some of them are political, like, you know, who's going to be the next number one enemy? Uh, what are we going to define U.S. vital interests as and those kinds of things? And we weren't going to touch that because those are the things that OSD wanted to test sort of within their strategy. What we had to do was give them the levers that they were going to pull to make strategy differentiations, to show how one strategy was different from another. And uh, what we came up with was this idea that at the end of the day, there's really four things that the Secretary of Defense has control of. Uh, and, you know, all models are a little bit wrong. This one's a little bit wrong. But for the purposes of our sandbox that we were designing, the idea was that every dollar the, the Department of Defense spends really supports one of four major levels, one of four, Sue likes to call them RIA stats. And those are, how large is your military, the size of the force? How ready is it for current operations? We hear about readiness all the time. How modern is it? Um, and there's all different ways to sort of define and parse modernization, but writ large, you're answering how modern is it? And finally, how is it postured? And by postured, we're talking about where is it stationed and how is it employed? So do you have a garrison conus where most of the force is here and you are responsive to events overseas by sending out flexible deterrent options or uh, rotating forces on a contingency basis, or is it forward presence? Uh, like when we had two corps and eight divisions stationed in uh, Germany. Um, and you can nitpick and say, well, what about this part of the budget or what, what about that part of the budget? But at the end of the day, this high level abstraction about the defense budget really falling into those four areas allowed us to create a situation where you really could think about fundamentally different strategies and rapidly sort of assess what the trade space is between a little bit less force structure to buy a little bit more readiness, a little bit less readiness to buy a little bit more modernization, a little bit more overseas presence on a permanent basis 
paying for or being paid for by maybe a smaller force structure. And you could trade amongst these and then play it out over the four hours of the game that we designed and, and sort of see what kinds of regrets it gave you about modernization or structure or readiness or posture as you went through it. We ran the game for OSD about 30 times um, and they used insights from that in the development of uh, the strategy that they published in 2018. As we were running the game, one of the things that we observed is that the players came in from very stoked type perspectives. So people who specialized in readiness really understood readiness. And intellectually, they could envision the fact that every dollar that came to them for their readiness ideas had to come from somewhere else in a fixed and constrained budget. It was zero sum. But they didn't have a conceptual idea of what that really meant for the people who were more concerned about posture or the people who were more concerned about modernization or the people who were more concerned about four sides. And so in developing and playing through these strategies with all four of those communities in the room, what we saw was that a lot of learning was going on and that people who, again, intellectually could understand a zero sum game didn't conceptually really understand what trade space looked like when you move buckets of money around between these. And so we observed that this might be useful for students of public policy to give them that grounding in this trade space at that abstract level. We weren't talking about do you fund the F-16 or the F-15. We were talking about the fact that I need to modernize. The details of that can be worked out at a budget level, and the details of that can be worked out with a service, and the details can be worked out through the political process. But the idea is really that's budget for modernization. Um, and so that was really the genesis for the chapter. From that, we at RAND actually published a game called Hegemony and Game of Strategic Choices. If you have $255 burning a hole in your pocket, 12 experts to play the game with, you're welcome to buy it. Um, <laughs> sit down on a nice Friday night and um, I'll bring the beer and pizza. But, uh, but if you're not prone to that, you can read the chapter in the book. And what the chapter in the book really talks about are some of the details behind all these. So readiness, for example, what could possibly be wrong about readiness? What, what's wrong with adding one more dollar to readiness? Well, the challenge is if you don't know when you're going to go to war, readiness is a wasting asset. So you buy and you maintain a lot of stuff that then sits in decays because you didn't use it or because you don't want to lose it because it's a wasting asset, you find a reason to use it, which then costs you money out of your posture accounts. If I spend all my time thinking about future modernization and funding it, then something has to pay for it. And so sometimes that's for structure. And we observed during the uh, wars in Afghanistan and Iraq that both the Navy and the Air Force chose to reduce force structure, volunteered to do so. In order to pay for modernization priorities, they made that trade. Uh, the Army historically has taken procurement holidays, walked away from modernization in the name of current readiness, especially when they're in 20 year long wars. Uh, and so the chapter just explores some of the costs and benefits within each of these large buckets. But the purpose of it, the reason that it exists in the book, um, it's a more academic, a more theoretical chapter than some of the others, which are very process oriented. If you want the process, the Army publishes every two years, HTAR, how the Army runs. That will give you all the process. There is no DOD equivalent. <laughs> uh, but if you conceptually want to think about a way at a high level to discuss DOD strategy um, and think through how it might confront different world events, then this abstraction of the four Rio stats, the four levels, uh, is a useful way to think through it. And that, Sue and Mark found attractive and wanted to include descriptions of it in the book. And I thank them for the opportunity to write the chapter. And I'll step down. Thanks, Mike. This is the point at which I'm supposed to wrap up. But, <laughs> but we have another author in the audience tonight. And so before I wrap up, 
<laughs> Probably unscripted, which is or which is which is not good. So uh, first, I have to thank Sue, right, because she's got all these distinguished writers and scholars working on this, and I'm like the the guy in the mud pit, you know, in, in resources, uh, you know, doing the math to make a lot of it work. And so, uh, so I was honored to be part of this project. Uh, so the chapter that I wrote really had to do with, hey, so you've got all these big ideas. How do you really, how do you really do it? And by the way, as the guy who was doing the money, it's only nice if you show up with your strategy, but I actually don't need it. And in the absence of your strategy, <laughs> I will design the army that I happen to think or the Department of Defense suits my needs at the time. Right, and that's not the way it should work, uh, but but it is. And there's two tenets that kind of come out of it. So the first is timing. Uh, so think about showing up with your Wi-Fi enabled phone, and you find out that you actually need an AOL modem. Right, it doesn't fit. Right, nothing works. If you show up with your strategy at the wrong time of the cycle of resourcing, it will either be ignored because it showed up too late, or at worst, like a living organism, right, your own tissue, your own service might attack it because it's disrupting the plan that has been carefully built. And so while you would expect your organization to embrace it, Right? We've been known to attack it just because we don't want anybody outside the organization to actually get any bright ideas to change around the delicate balancing that Mike just talked about between those four major accounts. And when you think about the timing, the system that Robert McNamara built up, right, it's very long lead time. Right. This is the ultimate batch and queue organization. Right. This isn't kind of like the internet, you know, where you worked it with just in time. So right now, today, there are four different cycles and four different resourcing games or cycles being played. And if you show up to the wrong path, right, it's like trying to get on a, uh, you know, on the express train to New York and winding up you know, on, 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 on all the local stops, right? You can't get there. So right now today, right, we're executing 2022, which was late. We are, the budget for 23 is on the hill. If you're showing up to try to change something in 23, so if you want to change something in 22, it's an act of Congress because they actually, enacted a law. In 23, you have to essentially go over and say, hey, by the way, the Secretary of Defense, Secretary of the Army, Sir, Chief, they gave you this program. It's actually wrong. I have a better idea. In the building, as we sit here today, the bloodletting is going on for FY24. Right? So the services all recently got their guidance cut this, do this, do that. So they are in full defense mode of their programs. And so they're in reaction mode, not actually trying to take a strategy and implement, which means that the cycle you want to hit is for 2025. That's where you as the strategic planner have the most flexibility. And it doesn't do satisfying if you show up in the Pentagon at 22 and they say, okay, great, you can do this. And Right, you can get some money in 2025, and by 2026, 2027, something will have changed. Uh, but you've got to understand all those times because otherwise you'll just kind of, you know, knock your head against the wall and leave. Go, I hope I never get another assignment to the Pentagon again. The last thing, and then I'll get off stage, is uh, the system has a barrier to entry to prevent the casual person from coming in. <laughs> Right. And again, it's time. Right. If you personally don't invest the time and I'm not talking about like days and weeks, it's a repetitive cycle of years of experience and understanding where all that stuff fits. 
you can't understand the rules of the game and how it all fits together. It's it's an impossible task. And so you've got to start early. You've got to encourage your students to start early. In the State Department, we heard, hey, can you take those? Well, you can. You can do it once, but you probably your career might be over, right? Uh, right. That's that's not right. That doesn't lead to the success. It, it, the system rewards when you hear about, you know, the the old people with the tennis shoes walking around and control all the resources. They've been doing it for 10, 15, 20 years, right? They know all the ins and outs, what can be done. Uh, so those are the people with the power. And if you want to understand and change it, you have to play the multi-period game. So thank you very much. So I hope that you enjoyed what you heard. Um, it's on me to conclude. Before I do that, I'd just like to say thanks to um, General Mike Meese, my former boss, um, for coming in here tonight. And, and the strings of Alanis Morissette's Isn't It Ironic are actually going through my head right now because I don't know if General Meese remembers that in 1998 uh, at West Point when he was looking for an extra econ professor, um, I said, you know, I really don't do econ. I don't like that stuff. Um, so, um, yeah, here I am, um, hogging the condo tonight. <laughs> so, um, I think perhaps I've grown a little bit, and so I think the irony I had to be mentioned. So, I got the job of writing the conclusion for this book. You all heard all of the different ideas in here. I have to tell you, I stared at a blank page for a very long time. Um, and in the end, um, I went to something I normally go to, which is the serenity prayer. Um, and I said, God grant me the serenity to change the, or to accept the things I cannot change, the strength to change those I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And I went, oh my gosh. I think that is the frame for the conclusion of this book. Because when you start talking about how you manage the resourcing process inside the United States of America, inside the Pentagon, inside wherever you happen to be, there are things that you cannot change. There is a ton of strength required to change the things that you might be able to change. And there is a ton of wisdom and rules that you need to understand in order to figure out which they are. So if you want to make a real change in this town, you better have that combination of serenity, strength, and wisdom. Because in some cases, change is impossible, while in others, it's possible if you're strong enough to hold the course and wise enough to pick your issues and pick your timing. Because as John said, the timing really, really matters. So let me highlight first a couple of unchangeable things, which Tom has already begun to highlight for us. Um, let's begin with the United States Constitution. Okay, the framers designed this government to be inefficient, and you're not going to change that, so please don't even bother. Second, the bureaucracy is not going to go away. you got to learn the rules of the game, and you got to learn how to work with it. The other thing that's not going to change is the budget math that the United States is currently facing. A lot of argument that we had among ourselves about how important you know, the, the debts and the deficits were. Um, in the end, um, the bottom line is the budget doesn't add up um, and the trajectory is bad, okay? And the current idea of whistling past the graveyard in Congress and whistling past the graveyard in policy um, is only gonna get us so far. And the trajectory has to change, although the will seems largely absent to actually get there at the moment. Now, there's a reckoning coming about this eventually. I think it's inevitable. But before I get all pessimistic, let me go ahead and highlight a couple of changeable things. Authors writing independently on radically different topics ended up pointing to some central critical nodes for change, which was a really comforting fact when I finally read all of the chapters put together. You know, first, um, you know, I think Jeffy called it a pipe dream. Um, but several people pointed to the congressional committee system. Um, you know, two authors um, pointed to the need for consideration of a select committee on national security to integrate the process that is currently so stoked. It's not going to be easy, um, but it's possible if there's political will behind it. We've done things like this previously. Second, several authors discussed the need to send a signal through the National Security Council process that strategic resourcing matters. Okay. The president has control of the National Security Council process. Okay, he can run that agenda. And so what we're doing is we're endorsing the recommendation of former National Security Advisor Stephen Hadley um, that the president should establish a White House-led review process involving a small number of OMB and NSC staffers 
to assess the allocation of resources and also the substantive process towards meeting substantive progress toward meeting the national security priorities and to recommend when course corrections may be needed. It isn't a cure all, but it could help. And that is a demand signal that the president actually has the ability to send and that the national security advisor can enforce. Third, and this is not a new idea either, but it needs to come up. We need to broaden our working definition of national security. And we need to broaden it beyond the DOD focus that it currently has. 21st century threats are more diffuse and more cross-cutting than the 20th century ones were. Look at the threats that we're facing to critical infrastructure. Look at the recent ransomware attacks. Um, you know, the advent of cyber and cyber as a domain of warfare and cyber as a domain of life, that seriously complicates the way that we view national security. Okay, then also look at the enduring effects of the COVID pandemic. This is a national security issue, but at the same time, what resources did we have to generate to put around it? We need to fund the DOD, but it's the estimation of many of the authors that it shouldn't consume 50% of the current available you know, discretionary budget. We need to take a real look at how we are spending and we need to rebalance accordingly. Final thought, change happens more easily in times of crisis. If you look at the National Security Act of 1947 and you look at the Homeland Security Act of 2002, both illustrate the possibility of change and reaction to crisis in that moment of consensus, okay? When you look at the first two decades of the 21st century, we have been bookended by crises. So 9-11 attacks and the COVID pandemics. Unfortunately, right now, crises seem to come along just a bit too commonly. But we should be prepared to take the opportunity caused by the crises um, to institute some of these needed reforms and to be ready to talk about them when the next crisis inevitably comes along. And with that, we have 20 minutes for questions. Thank you very, very much. So I think probably the best way to do it is if you've got a question, tell us who it's, ooh, tell us who it's for um, and just let us know what it is. Raise your hand and, and we'll call on you. Yeah, so um, I guess I think this is Tom because, um, you know, I, I think that, that you alluded really well about, about the DOD being the gorilla in the room that gets all the funding and the State Department, you know, Missing that funding that could prevent a, a lot of issues. Um, but there were like a few times that I, I can think of um, in my time in this realm that I think we've done some long range um, programmat resourcing programmatic stuff that we did well. Um, I look at base realignment and closure and taking Congress out of the political equation of that. I look at cooperative threat reduction. And you know, Nunn and Luger being real proponents for that. Um, I look at a strong, um, I think, I don't know, Eagleberger or Richard, Richard Holbrook in, um, in the assistance that we did for the former Soviet republics that created the kind of desire that Ukraine and Georgia have today to, to really embrace us. And I wonder, um, you know, Congress can be so short sighted and so parochial. What sort of lessons do you take um, from times when our policy has been more uh, able to have a long range view and how we get ourselves into that mindset? And um, I have a question also if I can be, my husband did not plant me for this one, but um, when he was talking about Germany, um, you didn't talk about any of the you know, other countries or the ways the different services have used that game. And I think that that's just an insightful thing to share. Second one, the way you did on the first one. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's a game was designed to be used by military service colleges and by graduate programs and undergraduate programs in terms of public policy. And we've been lucky or blessed that it's used now at the German uh, Staff College, it's used in Australia uh, for PME purposes. Um, we know that we've sell, sold several copies in Russia and China. We don't really know what the people there do <laughs> or are doing with them. Uh, so, and there's several uh, public policy programs that are trying to find ways to integrate the game in their curriculum. So um, it has resonated within the community and and they're figuring out how to integrate it into the, into the 
Now you get the next one. Yeah, we're gonna say you just said <laughs> that. Uh, first of all, Brack, you know, I was at a conference soon after Brack was enacted, and it was over at the Business Executives for National Security. So a lot of business people sitting around. Who in the world would ever design a system like that? And there were two people familiar with Congress who said that's exactly the system that Congress would invent to get their fingerprints off what is probably the most controversial. You know, most political science literature will, tell you, literature will tell you, yeah, if you're getting a defense contract in your district, that's important, but an installation you'll die for, right? So how do you create a process that gets the individual fingerprints of members who know that that, that base, that installation has to close? How, how do you design that process? It's, it's a classic American political finesse, and they're going to use it for the VA, as, as, as I can get this point, you know, more than, more than I do on this, but, you know, these are installations, right, and money going into political districts, and, and BRAC now stands as a model, so that's, I mean, but, but, you know, getting back to Sue's point, you know, it's not a crisis, but the Cold War ended, you know, after we closed all the bases in Germany and Europe, because that's easy, that's their politics, not ours, we still have a lot of bases that we have to close on our own, and we came up with the BRAC process, which stands. You know, uh, Nunn and Goldwater, boy, it's hard to find people like that. I, th I think Congress, the authorizers, right, who don't, don't, you all understand, authorizers don't produce money. That's only, as the Constitution says, that appropriation is the only way you spend money. Authorizers recommend policy, right? And and Nunn and Goldwater and and uh, even and Aspen, uh, but I, I think the Congress operated the authorizers operated better in the Cold War, War when the strategy was sort of set right. So so they operated within a framework where they could look at the long term, but they were grounded. You know I think when the authorizers sank in I think in the in their power over the budget when the Cold War ended because then you're you know, you're waving your arm around. Your arms around. China and Putin may may recreate a much more focused political process, uh, and we may see some some members of this, the Senate, in particular, I think, arise who have that long range vision. But I I, I do think that uh, the Cold War was an interesting time in our history, where where the strategy was set, and you could you could think within that basic groundwork about the long long term. And again, if I can add about yeah. Nun Lunar, which is a fantastic example, I could work on Nun Lunar programming at the State Department in the Non-Proliferation Bureau in the late 90s, which was after the Cold War, but there was still that strong consensus that securing loose nuclear material in the former Soviet Union yeah. was a critical national security interest of ours, and there was broad bipartisan consensus, and these great states of Nun and Lunar across the aisle to do that. And I'm like bittersweet, completely nostalgic now, because I don't know who, yeah. who are those statesmen now across the aisle. And you would think that an issue like supporting Ukraine in the war and planning for Ukraine, Ukraine reconstruction would be a similar issue where there'd be that broad bipartisan consensus for you to, you know, the senior statesmen to come together. But I don't, I just don't see that happening. So it's sad, but I don't, and I don't know what the answer to that is, but it's a great example of what, what we used to do. Mark, I'm not seeing. Oh, go ahead. Mark, can you <laughs> uh, Stanley Cobra, I'm a Georgetown alum. And when I was here, I studied in the Soviet Union. Um, there was a saying at the time, the uh, United States has a military industrial complex. The Soviet Union is a military <laughs> industrial complex. And that's what I saw, a lot of military, but the civilian economy was lousy. Mm -hmm. They had universal health care. Remember telling one of my professors when I came back, this was very popular. And he replied, yeah, but it's lousy health care. They didn't fund it. The money was going to the military. Mention the Vietnam era. What happened then? Guns and butter. How did that turn out? Stagflation. When I was in the Soviet Union, they called it the general crisis of capitalism. Didn't turn out quite the way they expected, but that was because we got disciplined in the Clinton administration that worked the debt down. It was very painful, especially initially. Now we have exploding debt. Mm -hmm. Now we have bigger Medicare. This is a big difference. To me, this is the problem. Mm -hmm. It's not so much the bureaucracy. We don't want to choose anymore. 
I remember going to a debate during the Trump administration. A guy representing the Republicans was mocking green eye shade Republicans. The Republican mocking other Republicans. The Eisenhower Republicans. That's the green eye shade Republican. But to me, that's death. To me, that is beginning to imitate the Soviet Union. And to me, that is the fundamental problem we're confronting. Mark, you want to take that? I know you wrote about it. Yeah, and and the the choice is either uh, either go go forward with a plan to resolve it or face crisis at some point. And and what? Yeah, if you if if you read chapter two and then infused, I think in you know in in, in Tom's portion and, and those sorts of things, there's this very strong theme. Uh, uh, I, I, I tell my students, I, you know, I, I name it the squeeze, where um, you have this growing portion of the budget that is set on automatic. And, um, and then what that does is that reduces the discretionary portion of, of, of your budget. And that's where the important generation of capabilities come from. That's your research and development. That's your infrastructure investment. That's uh, you know that's and and something we haven't talked about and 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 we can't within the scope of of this book. It would be the next one, right? So <laughs> is is all of those really important capabilities that come in you know the other assorted portions of the you know the, the, the capabilities that come out of treasury, really special capabilities that come out of state. Um, those sorts of things. Um, that that is why you want a robust and flexible discretionary portion of the budget, and and that if it is allowed to calcify, is uh, is really serious over time. So I I would affirm your view that we have it. It's not that we don't know how to choose necessarily is that we have chosen not to choose and put so much of the of the budget on automatic. We have a question from Zoom from Jason, who has a question for any member of the panel. Do you think congressionally mandated artificial budget initiatives, such as the Pacific Deterrence Initiative or PDI, are beneficial or harmful to the budget process? They're certainly focused. <laughs> so, so I would, you know, I would put a strike in the in the positive. Column. It's certainly a, a very clearly articulated strategy and and some form of programming that is giving life to strategy. I don't know, General Ferrari, what what do you think? Because I think you've worked much closer. Yeah, so I, I, I put it into the uh, generally negative category <laughs> because a couple of reasons. Number one is it's a laundry list of things actually absent any coherence. Uh, number two is if you're the Secretary of Defense and you're the OSD policy, you put this program together and it's carefully balanced, and somebody's coming in from left field and saying, "Hey, Congress, by the way, this is what right we first talked about, right? Uh, Tom thought, right? Th these are these sideways things that come in and disrupt the rest of the program. And if you assume, right, Congress only has so much flexibility to spend so much money, then it's coming at the expense of something else. So uh, in the era of emergency spending, uh, like during the war with OCO, mm -hmm. then it was free yeah. money. Nobody really cared. Now it's not free money anymore. So it's what are you giving up? That's been a real coincidence. Effect. You know, let me, I'd like to know where that initiative came from. Uh, you know, sometimes it's useful for a Secretary of Defense to be ordered to do something by Congress. So how much, where, where did that, I mean, it, it didn't, it just, I can't imagine it just came out of the Hill without any coordination with the DOD. And so you'd want to know the, the history of that. And also, does it come with more money? You know, is it sort of an oddly, you know, the gold watch syndrome where you, you take something important out of the budget, knowing that Congress is going to put it back in and probably give you the money to buy it. Maybe maybe there's some more money attached to that since it's coming from there. I, I just think this to, to blame it on the hill or attribute it to the hill without knowing the background is is a, a mistake. Uh, just three very quick comments. 
First of all, I congratulate everybody on what really is a great breadth of information. I got to talk to Rebecca later to find out who's using it here at Georgetown because I'm a <laughs> professor who may use it in my course, but I want everybody to use it. Um, the second is, it was great to hear, Mike, that they're buying your game in Russia. <laughs> <laughs> that may explain a lot of things that are happening. <laughs> <laughs> what, what happens if you do a deployment to Ukraine? Right. Is that, uh, anyway. Um, <laughs> And, and I guess this is more for Mark than anybody else, but tying the two comments together, the budget equivalent of BRAC would be the Budget Control Act of 2011 mm -hmm. yeah. uh, with a super committee and all of that, which if I recall was a Democrat president and two years later, a huge drubbing and Republicans coming into office in a mm -hmm. huge way. So when we get the Budget Control Act of 2023, that is the same words, just updated and we have sequestration. What are your thoughts? It sounds like you would be in favor of a sequestration type solution. Yeah, I, 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 I wouldn't be in favor of that because what that does is that, that locks in, uh, locks in a pattern, takes away all your flexibility. And it, it, it's, it's probably the most substantive thing that you could do to de-link strategy from. So I'd, I'd actually answer that a little bit. Yeah. yeah, and this goes back to this is how we met. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's when I met Jennifer Ferrari and I worked this together. Um, for, for good or for bad, sequestration and the skimmer was probably some of the best. And, and you know, so Sue, Sue says we always yeah. reform when there's crisis, but in terms of the best thinking through strategy development that we had. Is probably the best I saw in, in all my time in the Pentagon. That doesn't mean it was good because there were things about skimmer, things about sequestration that imposed sort of impossible constraints. But but the pressure to think and the, and the knowledge that you had to cut something and the knowledge that you didn't know how much you had to cut, so you had to have multiple plans and strategies. I, I think I saw more good thinking in the Pentagon in that six months or a year than I saw in many of the other years put together, be, just because there was a deadline. And deadlines, as you know, are clarifying in the mind. So yeah. and, and I, I wouldn't so, recommend it every year, though. Right. You know, like, yeah, just to, to yeah. put a, a comment there, Mike, just so people know, the skimmer that you're talking about is the Strategic Choices Management Review that we right, had to do right. in, what, 2013? Yeah, to 2012, 2013, yeah. that time frame. So, um, uh, so we're running out of money. It's time that we have to think. Right, yeah. exactly. exactly. <laughs> the money's gone. You know, yeah, yeah, but we're right. in a crisis, and we're going to raise the defense budget, right? And we're going to probably put army forces back in Europe, and and I don't know where that money comes from, but I think the defense budget's going to go up fairly sharply. The one Biden had, Biden has over on the hill, I think the hill will raise. Mm -hmm. They're not going to. I don't. I don't know why they would get into a budget control act when everybody's kind of in the mood to, to funnel money into that. <clears throat> All I'm saying is exactly the budget constraints that Mark described. Right. And uh, it'll be interesting. Yeah. 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 I, I note that, and, and so the, the flip side of this is so I, I had the unenviable job of trying to help the Army think through how do you cut end strength by 100,000? Talk about tough choices, right? Mm -hmm. My predecessor, twice removed, had the enviable job of trying to figure out how to grow the army by 100,000. And so she had gifts to give away, you know, every day. And I was the Grinch stealing uh, Christmas. Um, so you get sort of the good idea fairy when everything's growing and you get some seed corn and some venture capital and let's try this, let's try that. And when things are shrinking, you get very down. And, and again, I, General Ferrari probably talked to it much better than I could, but you get down to really tough choices with the the focus on developing useful metrics that doesn't exist at other times. We are at the witching hour. If going once, going twice. If you like what you heard. And you want to buy the book? <laughs> we have we have some copies for sale, actually at a forty percent discount off the publication price, which is kind of awesome. There's a Venmo. Um, you just go ahead and, and Venmo us and, and let us know that you're taking the book. Um, I would point out that Mother's Day is coming up, <laughs> and nothing says I love you, thank me for bringing, thank you for bringing me into this world 
like an e-context. <laughs> so, so on that note, um, thank you so much for coming.